Hello everyone, today we talk about the Atlantic Merchant Men for our historical ships series that uh, we're, it's not going to be dramatically long, uh, except we'll of course expand a bit more into actual naval battles and campaigns as well, because uh, the role of ancient and medieval fleets is at some point like overrated, at some point underrated in different ways. And this is always um, a pleasure, like building sort of a military um, culture as far as sea warfare is, is concerned. It's just really an important part of the polymologist's completion. Even when it gets down to aspects like this one, like that are what you would define uh, with some anachronism civilian, and not entirely. Uh, such as, in fact, a merchant man, right, a cargo ship of sort. Uh, we already looked at the Roman merchant man. Uh, we recently made a video about uh, the, that sense instead of properly a military um, ship, like of the classes Flavia Moisiaca, uh, the Danube, uh, River Rhine fleet, right, in, around Trajan's uh, invasion of Dacia that supplied relentlessly the enormous amount of uh, Roman forces concentrated for the terrestrial operations. So when we look at the Hellenic merchantmen, say, of you know the mid uh, first millennium BC, we're looking unavoidably at the Persian wars, at the Peloponnesian War, um, and therefore at a type of you know of warfare that heavily um, strain, like the logistical capacities of uh, the various contendants. Think about the gigantic uh, effort from the Achaemenid side to move such an enormous amount of troops up to the far west, to this you know, barbarian peninsula that apparently would have not had to, right, to worry the, uh, in fact, the, the kings of kings, like the universal rulers. Uh, the uh, same Athenian Thalassocracy, which allowed the polis to rise in a, to an important level of hegemony over many, uh, in fact, uh, equivalents of the of the Hellenic world, and that, however, also declined. Well, all these enterprises of, you know, epochal um, scale were heavily based on the naval supplies that these powers could um, provide like to the various powers either like uh, maritime or terrestrial right always considering what we were hinting at at the beginning that is to say fleets had mostly an ancillary function as far as ancient medieval warfare was concerned not just coastal navigation was preferred it was the, the habitual um, type we've seen how actually there were attempts like to cross large stretches of seas also with great uh, danger at some point of storms um, sinking the fleet and so on um, because at the end of the day these fleets were uh, in themselves like even in, in the properly the, the combat units were there to escort the same supplies for feeding the army on land Right, so most ancient medieval warfare, we've seen it often, I made multiple videos, also Byzantine uh, warfare, naval warfare, uh, and let's say discussed uh, often even sieges f um, carried out maybe from, from land, but with uh, the possibility of the defenders at some point to, to uh, resupply the settlement from, from the sea. We've seen it for the siege of, the siege of Acre, 1291. Um, and so, in other words, the function of uh, the, the the navies was the one of screening, like the supplies that were much uh, easier to transfer by sea than on land, for obvious reasons. Because literally, in a you know, uh, energetic sense, it's just like uh, like at sea, you, you you consume much less calories than than on land. Right, and we're talking, in fact, at some point, even very large expeditions. Think about, I don't know, 
the one the Athenian one to Sicily and before like we were mentioning just the Achaemenid invasions of Greece and more all right so when we look at the mule the humble uh, small vessel that uh, made mass as far as the 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 supply lines um, and volume of traffic was concerned we were really looking at these you know typically in fact small merchantmen um, that altogether had the capacity to have even passing like um, for example blockades at this point in naval technology you do not have the possibility of blocking hermetically even single straight like you can ambush cargoes you can find a way as we will see now with the Spartans trying to do with their allies during the Peloponnesian wars against the Athenians to prevent them getting foot but uh, in that case especially it was fairly hopeless because the Athenian net was so extended that even if the Spartans had had a significant capacity of blockading certain specific passages the, the straits um, between the Aegean and the Black Sea specifically there was always someone who could uh, ship supplies grain uh, to Athens right but it's also not always a matter of supplies right people overrate logistics as a form of you know as a branch of the art of war which is not right um, you may have a, a fully supplied army but if you don't make the right strategical decision you can uh, you will fail uh, big time um, so um, the and just to make long story short every civilian just like one of these Hellenic merchants could have had the, the the logistics behind this army's work after all just how to again employ them strategically was a political decision um, uh, and also of course a military one that the guy wouldn't have much the mind to um, to direct right if not to just assist and comfort and find perhaps the best way to make it work but not in a in a military sense right this division in the art of it, it's not even within the art of words between properly strategy and something that lays outside of that right and uh, it's just like I don't know uh, every uh, civilian engineer can build a trench but where to locate it and how to man it properly is an entirely different business from his own right so never confuse technology or um, say this material side of the stories as you know for the, the usually deterministic materialistic uh, mythology about how wars are fought right won and lost um, as you know I'm lengthening a bit the video because there is not an enormous much to say actually if I were an archaeologist or you know someone particularly uh, passionate or specializing in um, in fact in novel history I would I would go on uh, at length naturally the more dense um, videos regarding these uh, episodes regarding this kind of um, ship videos are going to be the, the warships right as we've seen also in other videos and even more of course the battles uh, that's the thing that actually matters uh, the most but even like the essentials like the the ABC of how these ships were built and employed their performance it, it's sort of it's sort of relevant uh, to just give the, the dimension of how these things really happen especially we've seen it with the um, the classes mosaica for example how many tons uh, could be transported that could like literally a few of these um, uh, of the ships could supply for days a, um, a fairly large army so that's the capacity to put these convoys at sea and escorting them properly was really crucial for any major operation especially again think about Greece and all like the, the coastal urbanism that uh, would in fact allow in significant ma maritime power to uh, to emerge and just like that had been fed literally by all these many merchant men going back and forth um, uh, with their resources and just for for civilian for civilian purpose um, so as you see like even from the pictures um, like the the Hellenic merchant man uh, the chronology is like say 500 BC but 
again we can arrive easily to the fork like uh, century uh, PC it's, it's not a big deal and you know also later things didn't overwhelmingly change right but um, right around these centuries it's uh, it's fundamentally a round ship right opposed to what had been developing as a as the long warship we have seen the pentagon thread the um, and other ships also dating properly to the to the late Bronze Age that had, uh, I mean, the Homeric one, a bit like I don't know the the Viking Langskip, right? As a that I also made a video on, by the way, that had that propulsion, um, let's say, priority and had to be in fact functional to amphibious operations, etc. These ships are built just to be you know, fat and uh, not particularly performing, as we will see now, but still getting the job done in fairly you know, normal uh, situations. Uh, the Atlantic merchantman would be propelled by a single square sail instead of by oars, but we will look at the latter aspect um, in the end because um, there definitely were hybrids, right? And especially in the military context because there would be in many ways some of these merchantmen uh, armed um, fit in a um, uh, just also simply seized by by the military right to uh, to be more performing and even in dangerous situations so that you could pass to the oars um, which was as we'll see now like not much of a problem of, of technology but rather a matter of cost right most merchants who armed these vessels did not have the capacity to to actually pay for the for the oarsmen and still being uh making money out of the business right so uh that's the main the main deal the atlantic merchantmen had a capacity of about 40 tons right which is a lot you can again feed um even thousands of troops with that um, and uh, it had a, a single hold, right? That is to say, the, a single space for carrying the cargo in the ship compartment. Um, so one compartment only um, for storing large masses of fundamentally homogeneous goods, right? Of all kind of think about wheat mostly, like grain. Um, and uh, the ship was completely completely decked, which naturally was important also to preserve better the transported good. There is uh, also a weaker screen along the side of the ship. Um, this could be helping in many circumstances. Um, again, it could increase the, the ship's uh, protection um, in general. The uh, Consider that there was a substantial amount of piracy as well. Um, so uh, the difference again we, we characterize the the merchant men as merely a civilian thing also um say you know, outside probably of a strictly military uh context but um all these ships were fitted in in a way that could put up some sort of resistance uh you know where or another there were weapons on board and um Usually, right? It depends also on the context, right? Uh, the earlier you go in time, the more that's the case. Eventually, ship's uh, equipment was a bit regulated, and tendentially, of course, these the crews were disarmed. But it really d depends on on who we're talking about and which routes um, and more. Um, the helmsmen, as we've seen often in these, you know, ancient ships set uh, in the stern, controlling. A double steering oars and the the structure above the wicker screen instead appear to be a ladder for for the crew like to ascend them as we have some some depiction here I I inserted some reconstruction mostly but also some um, vase paintings that uh, will give us this this uh, this info right uh, the ladder was used to ascend a mast because there were no shrouds in case you didn't notice and naturally the, the navigation was sort of quite simple right um the merchant man could carry sweeps that 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 are essentially long heavy um oars right uh, in this sailing vessels 
in case um, the wind failed, right? However, as we were saying before, the oars for normal commercial purposes were not usual, right? There would be, but the capacity of employing the around 20 rowers, that, as we'll see now also from the ship's dimension, would have, you know, ideally, like, been um, lodged uh, in the vessel, um, for the sailing season may have costed something like between 1500 to 200 drachmae. This sum was far beyond uh, the means of the small ship owners who would have had only one vessel, by the way, and sailed themselves with it. Um, so uh, it, it's still a very primitive system. Um, nevertheless, hybrid or merchantmen, as we were saying, are to be found. Uh, primarily, they would have served as military transports to make the the, su the supplies delivered in with more um, with greater speed in the first place, but also more exactitude in general without delays. Um, not only, however, surely there were some more powerful ship owners would provide some of their vessels with salaried oarsmen that was also just like the normality as you know in this um say in, in classical times right they weren't technically like slaves at, at the oars um and actually the, the oars were very well paid but we're mostly talking in fact about warships as we've seen already uh, in other videos right um, you know that the rise properly of Athenian telesocracy has to do even properly with the social instances of the oarsmen of the fleet that belong to the to the demos um, there's all a change like in of course from like some some centuries before we, we of course um, like to stress this this as more modern aspects of the uh, especially of say polis like Athens and Sparta that were sort of the, um, of course, what we mean as classical Greece in, in many ways, and, and especially Athens. But in fact, in many ways, they had been up to very recently um, very primitive, very archaic system. Um, so there is all a passage uh, from that, I don't know, Bronze Age pirate to this point. Of course, there were several hundred years passing so it was not from from a day to another but bear it in mind that there is some um, some entrepreneurship that is connected also with um, with piracy with by the same the, the, the sign of the same merchants by the way right so the capacity of um, protecting one's cargoes is just like at a subtle level just a reflection of that, um, that maritime business that had been going on in the Aegean also violently from, from quite a while. Um, so this Hellenic merchantman uh, would have, let's say in general, a, a single square sail as we've seen and it's not entirely clear how masts there were um, like two were already known in the Western Mediterranean this period, for example, the fore and aft sails um, would be within 200 years. Known by us, by the way, they they surely were already there. Made a video entirely uh, dedicated to in fact the types of sails uh, existing in, in in the ancient world. Uh, the fore and aft sail is basically there are two types of sails, like a sailing rig. Um, the, the fore and aft and the square one. So the square one is kind of obvious. The fore and aft is, um, at least today, it's usually triangular. We're also quadrangulars, uh, um, especially at this point, and is set completely aft of a mast or stay parallel to the ship's keel. And so it basically takes the wind on either side, and this uh, helps naturally to to steer much uh, more. Uh, scientifically, the mainsail has a, has a boom pivoted on the mast, 
Um, and this had, of course, to do with with the uh, with specific um, needs of traffic, right, of, of trade in the first place, and having more performing ships uh, in general. So depended uh, part on, on the on the size, uh, and also what again you would do other than just carrying supplies, as we were saying before regarding some more aggressive. Uh, ways of, of act. In any case, uh, these all these characteristics were known from from quite a while, and just we don't see them fully um, um, express, let's say, uh, documented. But we know that they were there. Um, so, in the pictures that I inserted, if you look um, like from the pictures, most of them is is the is the Kyrenia ship model that is sort of they made a reconstruction in fact there is a there are the photos at sea of, of the same um and uh, it's a, a fairly small vessel after all right also the one i used um you see this sort of cartoonish pictures are uh, there from the ai on an accurate model i gave it also small but as we've seen also with the roman riverine fleet like these small vessels had a, an important um, volume uh, of uh, cargo, forty tons as a mass is as a load is, is really, you know, like especially for the the essentials like for feeding uh, the a population or a besieged city, etc. It's, it's really a lot uh, of stuff. Um, the ships um, double the length were quite usual, however. Right uh, here, the length is say around 12 meters, right? So you could have uh, otherwise a vessel of 250 tons capacity. Um, the Peloponnesian War so in fact like a uh, an increase of this of of, of the of the cargo. Just. Look for, for the individual ships, and um, because again, of how much of the the policy was played and the capacity of being able to supply armies and and police and so on, um, this was not just unique to the Peloponnesian War. There had been larger uh, merchantmen around. Just the we can imagine the, the most typical being probably in a civilian use. The smaller, and the smaller one, from like a single guy's business or something. Um, the beam would be a bit more, a bit over three meters. The draft, not reaching two, right? Uh, there were interesting names around, um, like the uh, the brothers Adelphoi is witnessed for as an ancient merchant ship name uh, stressing of course like the the, the company right the, the business association of course it was a crew but not of um, of oarsmen as it was a single one as we've seen but we can't think on average this this size like 12 meters in length six seven including the owner master that as we said would be quite personally involved at this uh, level of uh, mercantile investment. Not to leave you with too few, I would like to point out some aspects uh, from the Peloponnesian logistics uh, leading to the say to, to the concrete um, acknowledgement of how concrete these maritime cargo supplies were um, during the period. Um, so there was first of all um, a, like a, a general policy to protect the naval supplies uh, in Athens, for example. This this uh, mm, same supplies once reaching the Piraeus from the various um, you know locations which the grain was imported um, were protected by an export ban. Right, Athens reserved essentially some that. The control, like this is one of the basic 
um, things that a state does, like the monopoly of control of a specific amount of vital resources for maintaining the state. Um, we know from like the, the random remark, by the way, in Aristophanes, the frogs, 364, uh, of um, prohibition on the uh, shipment overseas of things like sailcloth, pitch, um, and um, the, the, the ascomata that kept the water out of the lowest ore port, right? So all incredibly vital um, your resources uh, for having probably also a war fleet in the first place. And th there were other ships that were carrying this stuff. Um, a restriction of this sort would have applied naturally to to many, if not all other items to, to degree at least, that, uh, especially for, for the warships um, of the Piraeus. Um, Pericles' mm, policy and strategy regarding the war with Sparta, as you know, was uh, avoiding confrontation on land, right? He would bring the population into the long walls. Um, he would deny the Spartans, uh, like, uh, an open field engagement. And he would thus rely mainly on the navy to protect the same uh, Athenian, the same Athens in practice, but the same grain supplies that were protecting Athens thus, allowing, uh, allowing the, 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 the defensive resources on land in the first place, including this massive infrastructure of the long wall, but also this navy facilities like the just the port right um, and more um, securing all those resources that that by the way the same expensive naval policy um, had brought Athens to, to rely on to depend on um, like naval warfare is extremely costly we made a video expressly making a comparison uh, with the uh, like very empirically but with some foundation between the cost right in relative terms of course that a a Athens had at this point for for its navy and today's US one right and there are, needless to say two very different contexts but given the US um, naval projectional capability worldwide and say the comparative like um, a role that Athens had within, you know, the the boundaries of 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 those uh, times capabilities. The number that came out in the end, in terms of uh, like comparing the GDP with the with the cost of like the, the sorts of the salaried orders, because th that was the the point. Like it was just like having an army at sea. Uh, were strikingly similar, right? Proportionally, so it it's um. Uh, it gives you an idea of how incredibly expansive this policy uh, was. And again, the context is different. The way, uh, like, of course, these this navies were conceived uh, just politically and strategically very different. But, right, regarding the sustainability, that's an interesting parallelism. Um, so the expenditure in shipbuilding was counterbalanced by different measures for example the annual uh, savings from tribute right that was exactly in turn by the same navy we'll have to talk more directly i was thinking about starting even a series about ancient greece in the first place um but of course like uh, what athens looked at largely was the capacity to continue maintaining its own great uh, naval uh, capacity um, aside from the more episodic uh, needs of invasion, like with, with, with an army, and next to the also the absorbed ones, in, probably in defense uh, on land. Um, so the there was also another issue that, of course, in times of war, the cost uh, turned out to to multiply itself. Right, you have this enormous maritime net and uh, like all the things that co can go wrong when you are facing um, say also a, 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 a novel, an enemy novel 
seaborne capacity is not as high as yours, but that will create problems. Um, will uh, really com overcomplicate or will make the, the same cost skyrocket out of the, the so many like the, out of friction and all the things that can can go wrong normally. Um, so the Thucydides tells us, by the way, how essentially Pericles' plan overall um, had been thought out and how he would it would actually play out. All right. So when um, the, the Peloponnesian War ended in a sort of stalemate, right? That was the the ultimate point. The, the two systems, the two rivals, had sort of counterbalanced one another as it often happens in war, especially uh, the larger the contendants, right? The scale properly of the engagement. Um, the um, Spartans on their side, of course, were preoccupied with cutting off the Athenian um, supplies at their very source. Naturally, the Athenians were doing the same with Sparta because they had the upper hand, right? Also, the Spartans would import um, their, for example, uh, like the, the Athenians would stop like um, the Sicilian imports to Sparta, right? In 426, they dispatched um, Lachis and uh, Caraides to properly prevent the grain being brought into the Peloponnese from, from the west, which, like the Spartans were hoping, like, because that was the, the opposite side um, from uh, Athens. But, of course, the latter's maritime reach was like, pretty much across the entire Hellenic world, right? Um, Athens was, in this sense, also vulnerable because it depended much more largely than Spartan maritime imports, especially the 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 ones of uh, grain from the Black Sea, uh, like Pontic Steppe. Archidamus, for example, was hinting at this in 432 BC when he uh, supported the Spartan policy to build a, a navy uh, uh, and to disrupt such grain imports, Thucydides tells us. Um, and the stalemate in the Peloponnesian War would stem from the fact that both powers didn't have the capacity of knocking each other supplies out completely. Right? This was aside from the means, like out of the, um, the overall uh, scale, say, statal capacity at the time. Sparta had an agricultural interland, right? Athens didn't quite have at least in order to maintain the same level of competition with Sparta um, on land, right? So it had to import at least um, resources for, through, uh, through this uh, s supply ships. Um, so the, 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 there were Spartan efforts to uh, match the Athenian navy. The um, the the were revolts also uh, fueled by the Spartans overseas, uh, in the in the centers under the Athenian telesocracy. There was an attempt to block uh, the Hellespont crossing. Um, however, the um, main opportunity to disrupt the Athenians came after their disaster in Sicily, 413. At that point, the Spartans sent their Kulidas to the Ellespont in order to uh, essentially trigger a revolt in Abydos on the, on the Straits. This was yet another Athenian uh, vassal polis. During the same year, Clearchus sailed with 40 triremes to carry out the blockade, right, and so hoping to prevent the Black Sea grain supplies to, to arrive to Athens. But Agus of Sparta, who was holding the Calaia in northeastern Attica at that point, reckoned that that blockade was useless because Athens' uh, supply lines still were uh, working, you know, were another, through other paths as well, the 
a ruler was seeing himself the grain ships put, being put into the Peirius, as Xenophon tells us. So hence the, the stalemate, right? The alternative would have been properly to confront the Athenians, like to make this enormous effort in, uh, in creating uh, naval power strong enough to crush the Athenian navy at sea and so practically uh, annihilating it uh, and uh, preventing, like, the, blockading the same Athens and so at that point choking it for good. But this only brought to some Spartan disasters and absolutely so both in 410 and 406. The latter I documented with the video about, in fact, the Battle of the Argunusai Islands that uh, really are like a quite typical engagement in which Sparta brought um, a cons of a really a, a remarkable force to confront the, the Athenians. And things could have gone otherwise, by the way. This is not to say that in general, like, like yes, Athens did win, but again, at sea, as, as that battle shows, by the way, in many ways, there could be so dif many different factors that just could um, make the, you know, the, the swing uh, shift uh, quite uh, quite quickly from one side to to another, right? Um, we're talking also about largely homogeneous, like in technical terms, means, right? Here we're talking warships, but my point was rather uh, the, um, let's say, the cargoes. Like, yes, there is in 405 the Battle of Aegos uh with Lysandros managing finally to uh, crush the Athenians. This did succeed to temporarily prevent the Black Sea grain arriving to Athens, and that henceforth would remain more vulnerable. But let's say also Sparta would start having its own uh, problems. Later on, we talk about the Battle of Leuctra. Um, the um, you know the the Athenians, however, the Athenian Thalassocracy came um, fundamentally to an end. Uh, the the Athenians would would be to suffer yet another blow in 386. We will look at these stories individually, but just bear in mind how all this, after all, depended on, materially speaking, and also in terms of the the resources invested and, of course, the, the, the human uh, ones, right, that uh, were, were there on these merchantmen, right, in very, like in that sense, a controllable way because a blockade could be carried out around particular, like, ports. There could be, at least the straits could be dominated. You could arrive to, um, right, to shrink dramatically the volume of traffic that would reach um, a, certain, a certain region. But it, it's not, as you understand, as we were saying before, it's not much the the novel technology, it's the strategy of it. It's the fact that if you manage to knock out the Athenian navy, you, you don't just take away uh, the, the Athenian resources to, uh, in fact, to, to strike back at sea, uh, but with that, ipso facto, you are um, making all the polis that depended on Athens uh, to essentially maintain her theocracy standing um, to simply rebel and to, to be out there on their own, making their own trade, right? And, like, things are... Uh, it's always politics, right? It's never, like, uh, like some strange factor out there. Now, a war will go like this because we simply, you know, um, deny the enemy to do something. Like that. The, the enemy will find something else, right? As, as long as he has the will to fight for whichever reasons that are intertwined with all the political reasons in the world out there, right? And so it's always a game of that kind. Sometimes it does get, of course, to the military instrument, but the military instrument is just a continuation of politics, as we know, with other means. And so it's literally the same thing. Um, these videos are, 
again today as I was saying inserted a bit like this excursus to partially picture how um, the Athenian telesocracy depended on these um, vassals uh, but uh, there is naturally like all uh, another dimension to look at but again we have to do either starting a series on properly Hellenic history not just warfare which I'm tempted to do there are some uh, cycles branches that are essentially going to be exhausted relatively soon and so I have to think about what to do actually I wanted to insist a bit more on the Middle Ages I could just not replace those branches in the first place but um, here and there like expanding a little bit in some other directions can be can be important can be fascinating right I'm actually taking uh, all my time to resort to other specials at a point I have all a project like of, of going on like it depends on the phases of the year telling the truth now I, I've been consolidating just um, through the normal cyclical order of topics but we should come up with, with something more clamorous something sometimes even more basic but something that helps gluing better all the content together I hope that also the humble Hellenic merchantman is going to contribute to this um, for today however I stop it here I just hope that you enjoy this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye